Thank you <clears throat> for asking. If you can gather yourselves together and center yourself, please. Creator of all things, we ask for your guidance and blessing as we move through this evening, honoring the women of our world. We ask for your help in providing guidance to our young people in this time of strife across the world. We ask for your help in the healing of our nations as we deal with the trauma that has happened to all our generations in the last few hundred years. Help us to be good role models and to treat people with respect and kindness in everything we do. Hawa, creator, amen. Hawa, Barb, thank you very much for starting us off in a good way. Good evening, everybody, and welcome. I see there's still some coming through on in the waiting room. So for those of you that just joined us, welcome. Uh, my name is Christine Smith-Martin. I'm the CEO of Coastal First Nations Great Bear Initiative. Uh, my Haida name is Hatiela. I come from the Yachlanis clan of Haida Gwaii, and I will be your co-host this evening. Uh, and, well, along with uh, Leslie Brown. Leslie, did you want to introduce yourself? Sure. Um, my name is Leslie Brown. I am here in Old Masset on Haida Gwaii. My Haida name is Hilan Jet Hyala, which means Thunder Woman Dancer. It was given to me with by my nani. Um, I want to thank everybody for being here. Thank you. Thank the amazing women on the panel tonight. I look forward to the discussion that we have on this very special day for us. Um, and uh, thank you, Christine, for asking me to assist you. Thank you, Leslie. And I, I do also want to acknowledge the traditional unceded territory of the Squamish, Tsleil-Waututh, Musqueam Nation that our Coastal First Nations offices are on. Uh, Sim for allowing us to be on your beautiful territory. We're really excited about tonight, and I, I do, uh, Leslie will introduce the panelists later and, and thanking them for coming and, and sharing a little bit about who they are. We thought we'd start a series um, of sort of coastal connections series, and we thought this would be a great start of an interesting topics throughout the whole coast. And tonight we thought we'd kick off this series um, with International Women's Day. Today is a great day to celebrate all the amazing matriarchs, the amazing women, the moms, the sisters. Um, we thought we would have a great start to this series and, and invite the amazing panelists that we have. Uh, tonight, you'll hear a little bit from each panelist talking about sort of what brought them to where they are today. Uh, what are some of the things they wanna share with us? I always think it's interesting to hear from leaders. Uh, um, sometimes we, you know, as especially with women, um, we share a lot more about who we have um, learned from, uh, what areas are difficult for us and uh, some of the challenges that we've overcome. So tonight we'll get into all of those pieces and we're very excited. So to kick it off, we wanted to share a video. Uh, it's a video of one of our panelists, Vanessa Ballas, that we thought we'd share tonight. So if I can ask Amber to share that video, that would be wonderful. This is a razor claw. It's a important food for the Haidas. Lots of people will harvest it for eating for the winter. Lots of people harvest commercially for some income for themselves and their family. So it's important to keep it sustainable for generations to come. We have a joint management plan with Department of Fisheries and Oceans for a commercial fishery on the razor claw. We harvest it at a sustainable level 
because of our involvement as the Council of the Haida Nation. We collect all the data, we analyze it, and come up with the commercial quota for the following years. So we can get an estimate of the biomass of the clam bed, and then we harvest at a 22% rate. So that's what we come up with the quota. Part of the management plan is we do have people monitoring the fishery. So our guys, our guardians, will come out and do a beach patrol, and then they'll go to the offloads at the cannery. So I just came out with my family today to dig some clams. It's important to me to be out here to teach my children how to harvest our traditional foods so that they can enjoy them like I did as a child. A healthy ocean is so important. We get all our food from there. They say when the tide's out, the table is set. I couldn't imagine not be able to harvest our traditional foods, it would be a catastrophe. It's what we are. We've lived off the ocean from the beginning of time. Excellent, thank you. That was, that was, it always gets me so emotional when I see that guy. It's because it's my home territory and just the way that our women in our community are, are, are the backbone of our communities. And, and uh, Vanessa is a great example of that. And so maybe I'll pass it over to Leslie if you can introduce, introduce some of our panelists tonight and welcome to those that are just joining us as well. Sure. Um, I wanted to first introduce Vanessa, like this, the video itself, it really does, it, it brings up a lot of emotions as a mother, um, as somebody who who's upholds Haida values really highly, it was something that both Vanessa and I were raised with, and um, she's the fisheries manager for the Council of the Haida Nation, she's an amazing mother, she's an amazing daughter, she lives what we call hot hinganga. It's the height of life. Um, but we wanted to, the panelists to introduce themselves and then also answer a question for us. We wanted to ask, who is your mentor that allowed you to walk through the doors that you have? So um, just somebody that you would um, share a story or lessons that they taught you. Um, whatever they, what strength they've given you. So um, I'd like to go with Vanessa first and then we could move on to the next panelist. Actually, I could do the whole panelist. Do you want me to do the whole panelist? First? Sure, yeah, if you could do sure. that, Leslie. Okay, so we have Vanessa Bella. She's the Council of the Haida Nation Fisheries Manager. And then we also have uh, Chief Counselor Marilyn Slett here from Hiltzik Territory from Bella Bella. Uh, Jennifer. I'm trying to find Jennifer in the midst of everybody. Where are you, Jennifer? Jennifer. Oh, there you are, Jennifer Wachtus. She's the <laughs> chief counselor for Weekend. She serves on an all women's council for the first time. That's very exciting. And then we also have Keel Juice, Barb Wilson here from Skidigit, and then Linda Innes. So we'll go with Vanessa first, if that's okay. I'm actually a counselor. Uh, Danny okay. Shaw is our chief counselor. Okay, sure. Sorry about that. I'm gonna have to pay somebody. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead, Vanessa. Uh, good evening, everyone. Hello, Leslie, for the introduction. My name yeah. is Vanessa okay. Bellis, and um, I'm the program manager for Haida Fisheries Council of Haida Nation. My Haida name is Siakum Red Moon. It was given to me by my great nanny, Florence Davidson. It was her mother's name, so Isabella Eden Shaw's name. I feel very honored to be here this evening, um, International Women's Day. Um, so how about for the invite? So who is my mentor? There's been so many in my life. Um, I think in my personal life, it's, uh, it's, been, it's always been my mom. And my nanny, my nanny Primrose, and uh, 
my great Nani Florence, but all, all very strong women being so strong and showing me so much strength and love. My mom always gave me the strength to be myself. Um, she never told me that I couldn't do anything. And so uh, I have four children uh, between the ages of seven and 16, two girls and two boys. Uh, and uh, so it's very busy. So my and talking about my mom, she always gave me the space to be my, my to be myself. And uh, recently, my oldest daughter said she was thinking about becoming a marine biologist, and she wanted to have a commercial diving ticket like me. And so I was asked her. I asked my mom recently, like, how did you feel when I came home and told you I was leaving for seven weeks and I'm going to be a commercial diver? And um, she was like, I, you've always done what you've wanted to do. So she's always giving me that space to be myself and to be strong. She's shown me extraordinary strength my entire life. So, and in my personal life, I would say that, or in my work life story, like I've always, our late executive director, she, um, she was quite inspirational in her work, she was like always under a microscope, people constantly verbally attacking her, but she carried herself with such grace and humility and professionalism. She wouldn't even raise her voice. So I think about her every day when I'm in my office and I'm having to deal with um, the everyday work that I do. And I strive for that professionalism it's not easy work, and I think it's it's not easy and can be very challenging working for your own people. So, Hawa. Hello, Vanessa. That was, uh, I wanted to share a story, a little story about Vanessa. She's such an amazing person. We went to Haida Gwaii this last while with Rogers, and I was worried about my boots and, you know, me being me, I had these boots and jacket and everything. And there comes Vanessa in these amazing shoes. And she is just like on fire. She's pulling things up and her high heels. And I'm going, oh my gosh, I'm never complaining ever again. And, and you did it with such grace. And you were, it was amazing to watch you. And my daughter even said that, that woman is amazing. So I, I just wanted to share that with you, Vanessa. Uh, next <laughs> week. <laughs> Next, we have uh, Marilyn. Marilyn is not only a chief counselor of the House Chuck Nation, she's also the president of Coastal First Nations. And um, it's, it's an honor and pleasure to have you here today, Marilyn. So if you can sort of introduce yourself and then talk a little bit about the person that uh, was a, a mentor to you and what, what about them that um, what, what allowed you to be where you are today. So Marilyn, if I could pass it to you. Okay. Uh, first, I want to thank Barb for the wonderful prayer that she did. Um, I was sharing, I was texting, you know, earlier saying, geez, I feel a bit nervous tonight, you know, about doing this. It's been a while. Uh, but, you know, Barb, your, your prayer, you know, really grounded, grounded us. So thank you for that. Really appreciate it. Um, my name is uh, Marilyn Slatt, and I'm um, the chief counselor for the House of Tribal Council. And I've been in this uh, role for 14 years. And I was first elected to uh, the chief counselor position when I was 40 years old. So I'm getting up there now in, <laughs> in age, but um, you know, it's gone by so fast. You know, it does not feel like 14 years. You know, it feels like a couple years. Um, and uh, before that, I uh, was the executive director for my nation for five years. And then um, subsequent to that, I was an, elect an elected counselor for two consecutive terms. So I started uh, in the political arena in my community when I was 32. And uh, now I'm going on 54. So it's it's been a while, but you know, it's been, um, you know, one of the most, it's probably, you know, up 
the most challenging thing you can do is work for your community, but it's also one of the most, you know, the best things you can do is work for your community and, and to, to be, you know, a public servant and, you know, serve your community. So I'm really grateful, you know, to be able to do that. Um, my ancestral names have been uh, given to me and passed down to me by, uh, on my maternal side. Um, Kawazit is uh, translated to treasure box and Gaguya is uh, beloved. And those were both, both passed to me by a great aunt and my grandmother. And, um, you know, they, I, and I feel like when we have our ancestral names that, you know, we really carry, you know, our ancestors with us. And, you know, that's part of what gives me strength, you know, when I feel like I need, you know, that extra support, you know, kind of draw from within. Um, my mentor is my mother. Uh, her name is Bessie, and she's a very gentle uh, woman. Um, she works hard, you know, she's worked, you know, her, her career, um, you know, to raise us to, you know, to, you know, put food on the table along with my father, you know, she worked in canneries, you know, she worked as, you know, a custodian for the Richmond School District. You know, she didn't start working until we were all, you know, through uh, elementary school. You know, so she's always, you know, given me that, you know, um, you know, that value of working hard. You know, we have to work hard to, you know, to pay our rent, to raise our families, to, you know, be able to, you know, enjoy the things that we have. So, um, she's also very generous with everything that she does. Um, you know, she's a gift giver. She's always giving gifts to people in our community. And, you know, um, and that's, you know, just, she's got just a wonderful big heart. So I strive to be kind, like my mother. You know, I, I really, um, you know, aspire to, you know, to be that generous and to that, and that kind. Um, it always to be, you know, she's always, you know, shared with me and, and my siblings to be proud of ourselves, you know, be proud to be Hilsuk, to be proud, you know, to be from Bella Bella, be proud of our family, you know, be proud of our community. So, um, yeah, that's, that's my mom. And, you know, she uh, is always, you know, gentle and in my corner. And, you know, if I'm feeling, you know, um, butterflies and anxiety, you know, she, you know, encourages me to, you know, push past that, you know, and do the, do the work that needs to be done. Thank you. I'm Marilyn. Thank you for sharing that. Uh, next, we'll go to Jennifer, Jennifer Walkus. Um, it is amazing to, I, I just was telling everybody, I just heard today about uh all of your counsel and your chief counselor being all women and uh, really exciting. And I think it's a great tribute today at International Women's Day that you have a council that's all women and your chief counselor. So if I could have you introduce yourself, Jennifer, and, and tell us a little bit about yourself and then we'll put up your mentor too as well. And you can tell us a little bit about that. So pass it over to you, Jennifer. Okay. My name is Jennifer Walkus. I'm from the Awakening Nation in Rivers Inlet. Um, my Awakening name is Akwaskum. I am the daughter of Louisa Hanyus and Percy Walkus. And my mentors, I guess I'd have to say mentors, it would be my mom and my aunt, Evelyn Windsor. Uh, the two of them were very much sort of, I guess, of a type. They were both very, they knew what they wanted. They knew how they were going to get it. My aunt was much more, she said, I'd like to see this. She wouldn't tell you to do it, but she had that air about her that somebody would do it. She wouldn't have to tell you. It would just get done. Didn't matter who it was. If you didn't do it, someone would tell you to do it. <laughs> so and my mom was just very much, she, I grew up, she was on council when I was a kid. Um, she 
sent me to my aunt quite often for cultural teachings. And I went with my dad to get my start in stewardship. And so I wound up in very much involved in my nation. I went in and out for university, college, high school. Um, I spent half my time in Vancouver, half my time here. And I kept coming back no matter how often I would leave, I would always come back. And that was something that was always drummed into us that we have to be able to contribute. You don't take more than you need and you give whatever you can in order to make life better for everybody else. And you stand up for what you need. Somebody else's opinion of you doesn't matter. And as long as you can look at yourself in the face in the morning and be confident that you've done the best of your ability, then you should be proud of yourself. And so I guess I took that into my life with me. And I've always just been a geeky kid. Like I spend enough time reading that I used to apparently sit by the side of the road when I was a kid and talk to everybody who walked by going, read to me. So I just always had to know. And I keep doing that now. And so, <laughs> yeah, it's one of my favorite, favorite things to do. And they both taught me that there's no dumb questions and there's nothing wrong with not knowing the answer to a question. So you don't necessarily have to BS your way through it. That if you don't know the answer to the question, say, I don't know, but I can find out. And I think that's one of the things that I've always found really important in people I work with is that if you're willing to realize that you don't know everything that you can't put in put anything more in a full cup so work with the people who still want to be more and you'll always have something new to do and oh for council it's been really great this is we got elected two years ago now um, it was a full changeover. There's only three council members. And so it was three women, all under 50 at that point. I just turned 50 this year. And so having an all woman leadership when you're dealing with a lot of places like government and, and even some of the resource sectors where you're dealing with a lot of men who have been a part of the old boys club, having an all women council was something that it's really great a lot of the people were well we'll see what they can do and we'll give them a chance and then others were expecting us to fall on our face and so the fact that we were able to sit there and we all knew what we wanted we'd all been managers underneath various councils we all knew we wanted to push for having the right policies in place so everybody knew they were going to be treated equally and fairly and we wanted to get everything running smoothly and that was what was our main goal when we got in. And so that's been what we've been trying to do for the last two years. We're not all there yet, but we're well underway. And I'm really happy that we all got reelected. So it's a testament to the fact that we really tried to increase our communications with our people to make sure that all of our decisions were brought for brought forward to various committees so that our people had a chance to be able to have a say in how we were doing things. And so it wasn't all about, I'm going to be the leader. It's going to be, how are we going to do this? And how can we prop up our staff? And how can we train our staff? And so I'm happy to see we've gotten partway there. And now we just got, we've been given the mandate to continue. Wonderful. Thank you, Jennifer. That's so exciting. I, I, I hope to see an article soon in the media about that, because I think that's, especially on International Women's Day, that that is an amazing accomplishment. Um, well, Leslie will introduce Barb, and thank you again, Barb, for that wonderful prayer earlier today. Leslie? You're on mute. Oh, you're on mute. <laughs> that was a good dry run. <laughs> At least I bring humor today. I bring humor. Okay. So we have Barb Wilson, Keel Juice. She's a Haida matriarch, uh, scholar, educator, great grandmother. Oh, we love our great grandmothers. Um, she's got her MA in education from SFU. 
with her research and education links to traditional knowledge, land and ocean management and conservation, climate change and indigenous governance. Her dream is to go back to Hawaii to learn traditional navigation and teach how to use how to navigate the stars, clouds and the birds. Ah. So Barb, if you could uh, introduce yourself and your mentor, please. How are okay. How are Leslie? Mm -hmm. Kiildus Hamadikigaga. My Haida name is Kiildus, and it was given to me um, on behalf of who and the um, Hanji, um, somebody that I was in the past life. And <clears throat> so I, I carry the name, but I, I um, I belong to the Stawas Haidagai, which is the Kamshua Eagle Clan. My brother is the hereditary chief for, for our clan. And I'm I'm the Kuljat. I um, my my mentor was my mother, my mother um, and my father and my stepfather. Um, my, my mother got married when she was very young. She was 15. And so she only finished grade eight. And then she had me when she was 18. And um, when, when things went south, I guess you call it, um, she left home and went to Vancouver and she put herself back in school. And she went to school for three years and got her grade 12 standing. And then went to, um, went to BCIT and, and became a chef. And so she showed me through her actions that didn't matter what your age was, you could, if you wanted something, you could go after it. And so the thing she said to me, and, and I laugh often when, when I talk about it, she told me kind of on the side, she said, go out and travel all you want, work at whatever you want, go dancing all the time and date whoever you want. And when you get tired, come home. So that's what I did. She forgot to tell me to find a partner. So here I am. Um, I'm 79 now and I'm still single and, and but I've had lots of fun. Um, I love education. I'm, I teach at um, Simon Fraser and I'm working with Vanessa and other people on um, putting together um, course content with uh, UBC. And so for me, I wanted to be a scientist. I wanted to be a scientist. And the closest I guess this I'm going to get this time is working as a bridge between traditional knowledge and science. So that's what I do very effectively. I work with the, um, with the HEMAS in Central Coast the Hatwea on, on uh, Vancouver Island on the West Coast and the Kilsley here on Haida Gwaii. And so I uh, very much enjoy the challenge. And as Leslie mentioned, I'm now working with the Polynesian Voyaging Society to um, pave the way, I hope, for them to travel from Tacoma North through all our waters. And so I'm going to be um, getting hold of all the different nations and hopefully getting um, permission for them to travel through the waters and um, work on protocol with them and put together their plan. So that's, um, and then I'm working on, at the same time, I'm, I'm working on a healing, um, I call it, uh, healing with the knowledge of our Kunisi, our ancestors. So looking at canoes and 
all that and hopefully finding a way to heal the um, transgenerational um, or intergenerational woundedness that we all suffer from as a result of the laws that have been put on us. So that's, that's my dream right there is to help do that. And I hope that eventually we'll be able to share all that knowledge and do it in a good way. So Hawa, Christine, Leslie, everybody, I'm thrilled to be here with you. Um, if somebody had told me yesterday that this was going to happen, I wouldn't have believed them, but here we are. So Hawa. Thank for your wonderful words. Thank you very much. I, I need you to put up my picture of my of my mom and my stepdad. Is it there? Just for a minute. Oh, yes. Sorry about that. Amber, is that there? No, I'm sorry, Barbara. It didn't come through the email. Ah, oh, okay. That's fine. That's okay. Thank you. We'll try again just before the end. So we have a half an hour. Maybe we can try to figure it out and, and put it at the uh, put it at the very end. Well, Thank maybe, you, Barbara. Maybe, maybe I didn't send it properly. I'm always challenged <laughs> when it comes to this beast. <laughs> how a, how a Barb. Uh -huh. uh, next, I'd like to introduce uh, Chief Linda Innes. And she is the first female chief counselor of the Gitgatla Nation. And she was growing up in her community. She has always been motivated to be a part of positive change. Chief Innes brings in, I think it, this one says a diploma, but I'm pretty sure that she's uh, she's um, has her bachelor's now. I remember seeing that uh, um, on Facebook, but uh, she has her education in business administration and social work uh, that she brings to her position as a chief counselor. So please welcome Linda and Linda, if you can introduce yourself and perhaps share with us uh, who was your mentor that allowed you to be in that place, the place that you are in now. Thank you, Christine, for that wonderful introduction and uh, happy International Women's Day to each and every one of you. Um, I'm honored to be here with you as your guest today. I am speaking from the, our traditional territory of the Gekatla Nation, uh, Gitlamon, people of the salt water. So um, yeah, it's great to be here. Um, for myself, uh, you know, like you mentioned a bit of my educational background, um, I have a wealth of education. Um, I'm, I consider myself a lifelong learner. I love reading books and, and just listening to the stories of the panelists here. I feel like each and every one of you has a part of my story, you know, love reading, love learning, the land connections, our mentorship. I can definitely uh, feel the connections. And uh, before I go any further, I want to thank Barb Wilson for the wonderful prayer as well. And, you know, in terms of, of who I am, I feel like um, I am Simshi, I am Gekatla. I'm also Gixen. My father, my late father is from the Gixen community of Gidinyao, and he's no longer in this world. Um, he was one of my biggest mentors, taught me how to be strong, taught me how to be tough. But other mentors that first and foremost would be my mother and my late grandmother, Agnes. So here's the two of them. And earlier today, I took a good look at that. And consider them, you know, the roots of my raising. Um, both of them work very hard. They were land. They loved to work on the land. Uh, when my mother was a young girl, she was unfortunately taken away to the Indian Residential School. And, and by luck, alert, I believe it was in Alert Bay that Indian Residential School burned down. So she was actually sent back home. And she said her saving grace was that her parents took her right back out on the land. They reintroduced her to the language and uh, she has not stopped ever since. My mother, will, she's going on to 80 years soon and uh, she still loves to do land-based learning. And I would say that um, um, one of the biggest things that I learned from both of them is to have good work ethic to take pride in my work, to be independent, that nobody 
was going to come and do the work for you. You have to learn to do the work yourself and to be independent. And I like to think that that's work ethic that I instill in my, my three daughters, our three daughters, and now my grandchildren. Um, I think that when, you know, my mother raised five children with the help of her, her mother, my grandmother, and despite the challenges, they never ever gave up. And um, one of the, the sayings that my mother always had is that anything is possible. Anything is possible. And I carry that in my work today, even when I'm challenged, even if I don't know the path forward as a elected leader, I believe if we have a vision, anything is possible. Are we willing to work towards that goal to that vision? It's possible. I really believe that even when people don't believe me, I believe it. And you know, and my mother, my grandmother, my father, they taught me to believe in myself. And you know, you, we were faced with all the issues around colonization. Uh, you know, we were faced with challenges of poverty, child welfare issues. But, you know, my mother, she never let us go. She would stand her ground when, when the ministry would show up at her, her door. And I still remember that to this day. And I actually thanked her for that last week for standing her ground because I was old enough to remember. And, um, you know, she said, I'm doing everything that I need to do right as a mother, raising my children. So she's always been through her actions. She taught me how to stand up for myself, to stand my ground, and uh, definitely been my biggest inspiration. And I love her dearly for that. Thank you for listening to my story. Thank you, Linda. That's, I didn't realize it was going to be so emotional. It does feel so, you know, I can hear my nanny and my mom and my aunts and all of these pieces and all of your stories. So, so thank you very much. And, and I think it goes back to that, you know, as our roles as moms and nannies and aunties that these are really important pieces because that's what the leaders are talking about today. You know, family have taken time to instill all of these in, 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 within them. So I think it's such a great testament. And thank you all for sharing that. And I, I think we'll go into sort of some questions and uh, we have a couple of questions that we have. And, and maybe we'll start off um, with one question. And I think it's probably focused for the women chief counselors. And then we'll have one for counselors. Um, Close to one in five chiefs in First Nations communities are women. Um, so knowing that statistic, what has been your biggest challenge to be an Indigenous woman chief or leader? And maybe we'll start off with Marilyn, if you can share uh, what has been your biggest challenge being an Indigenous woman leader? Mm. I think uh, for me, it was um, recognizing that it would take me um, a while to be really grounded in who I am, in my own voice. Uh, we have had and, and continue to have, you know, really dynamic um, and big presence, um, uh, you know, male leaders in our communities. And you know, I, I really felt like, you know, that obviously is not me, right? You know, I'm, uh, you know, Marilyn, and, you know, this is, you know, how I, you know, carry myself and, and do my work. So it took me um, a while to feel grounded in my own leadership um, and recognizing that that was okay, you know, to, you know, to, you know, get grounded and, and, and that sort of thing. So, yeah, I think that was, you know, one of the things, you know, for me and, you know, definitely, um, you know, just, you know, asking, you know, for advice and, you know, I have, you know, professional um, mentors, you know, that I've, you know, had, um, you know, in my career and, and others that have been personal, you know, so, 
you know, I think that the key is really, um, you know, ground yourself, you know, be confident, you know, you're going to feel sometimes, you know, um, a bit of um, pushback, but, you know, uh, push through it, you know, use your voice. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks, Marilyn. And the same question with you, uh, Linda. What has been your biggest challenge being um, in the position you are and being a woman and, and being your first, uh, it looks like you're the first chief counselor in your community. Yeah, thank you. Uh, yeah, I think the biggest challenge is there's been many, but again, it's kind of like um, walking into a male dominated environment and um, coming in with, uh, um, a lot of education, a lot of work experience. And, um, you know, I felt that uh, there was not a whole lot of respect for myself as a female chief. And I felt, you know, like, and looking back at it, I could see that um, it goes back to, well, they don't know me in this, in this role. And that's fair enough. I get it but they know me in the role of a student. They know me in the role of a servant, uh, service provider. I've worked in the health and social services field. I've worked in education and um, I, I'm, uh, they know me as a traditional harvester, but they've never sat, I've never sat with them in a room and um, you know, like, did I understand the hereditary governance system to a certain degree? I understood. I come from a house chief. My house chief is Laoi, you know, and I know, you know, it go, it's tied back to Google Gans, which is our inheritance of our chiefs. I understood that. But I also, you know, like having to, I felt like the biggest challenge is having to prove myself. Yes, I understand le legislation. Less, yes, I understand infringement of our rights. Yes, I understand the social injustice. I've only been here for three years, and you know, it's it's uh, it's it's about having those conversations and the relationships. But in the span of three years, it's been difficult with the COVID situation. I feel like that's kind of blocked a lot of the good work in terms of the relationships we could have had within this community. So, you know, there's, um, I think that um, being female, um, uh, the first female elected chief, uh, I think that let's say the roles were reversed and it was always women running the in those roles for years. If, a young man was to break through that barrier and come in as the leader, would we all celebrate and rejoice that position? Uh, I don't know. I think in, in this day and age, I'm, I'm all for it. I'm supporting leadership growth and development, but it, it's a process. It's a, um, yeah, so I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Thank you, Linda. And I think some of the times, and uh, I find that as a woman, I have to sort of go the extra mile. I find anyway, I've got to do that extra piece just to show that and so that people will listen to me, which is sometimes frustrating. Uh, but once they sort of get to know me and get past that, but I, I find that weighs on my shoulders as well as is, is having to prove myself what, that uh, because I'm a woman, I have to prove myself. Yes, exactly. And, and I think even to this day, when I go to any kind of meetings or events, majority is it's a male dominated environment, but I'm, I'm really always pleased to see women in leadership in, in the, you know, uh, going to different conferences and um, being a guest with Marilyn Slat at one time, you know, it's, it's, it's impressive. Thank you. Um, I was asked once what like what do we do in our spare time and I was like what spare time we're saving languages for food harvesting for the winter and then we have to plan the potlatches and then we also have to raise children bring them to soccer games um, and then I was also asked once about uh, what do what, what is my hobby and I didn't realize 
I actually had hobbies because I, I have learned to weave and I feel like that's a responsibility and not a hobby. But uh, I enjoy fishing and I feel like that helps me reconnect to myself. Have that, It's almost like a meditative thing. So I wanted to ask a couple of their ladies, Jennifer and Vanessa, what are the ways that you stay grounded and take care of yourself? Uh, Vanessa? Yeah, I would have to say um, that making myself a priority has always been challenging because I feel like I'm pulled in many different directions all the time and someone always needs something. Um, one of the big things that I do for myself is um, running. Running has always been an outlet for me. I've run many full marathons, half marathons, 10 Ks. Uh, I like to stay active. So along with running, I like to lift weights, ride my road bike. I took up uh, road biking a few years ago when I turned 40. Um, my cousin that was, I was very close to, he, he, um, he rode, he had many road bikes and I finally like, I said, oh, I want to ride a bike. I really want one. And I don't think he thought I was serious and that I saved up and saved up and he said he would shop for one for me. So I do road biking. Another thing that really grounds me after a long, stressful day in my office is I go home and cook dinner for my family. Um, I think that's something that the love for cooking has been passed down from like our great, great Nani and just like my great Nani, she cooked until she was like, she was baking sourdough bread when she was 99 years old, like two or three weeks before she passed away. And um, it was the first time she'd ever made it. And she called my mom and she said, come and get some. It was the first time I'm, that she had made it. And she was laughing at the big mess in her kitchen and she'd made fresh jam for it. And so like cooking has always been an outlet. My nanny was very, very good cook and baker and very like um, always working hard. So getting me grounded is also like working on traditional foods, whether I'm canning fish or picking berries or at the beach with my kids digging. Those kind of things always make me feel like myself. And um, so now in working out and running, like that's always been a huge outlet. My oldest daughter and I run and work out together a lot and keep each other motivated. And I think it's just been, very helpful, especially during um, COVID, like living in a pandemic for the last two years, like I, it's been tough. And so to keep calm and keep strong for our families so you don't show your children that you're scared or you're worried or, you know, that let's just live our lives and live our lives to the best we can. So yeah, being active and cooking and harvesting and and just being with family too has always kept me grounded. I'd have to admit to you that Vanessa's family keeps me grounded. <laughs> I spent a lot of time with Vanessa and her family and I used to go to her house and because I, I grew up as an only child. And so Vanessa has a, a big family and they're all my age. So I'd go to her house and Oh, it was, it would keep me grounded. Uh, Jennifer, do you want me to repeat the question or? Sure. Okay, sure. What are the ways you stay grounded and take care of yourself? Um, I actually suffer from depression. I always have, or at least for the last 10, 15 years or so. So a lot of it is learning how to manage that. And so I read a lot. I, I've always liked to read. So for me, that's just always been me. But I like to get out and garden. It's taking care of something. I like to spend a lot of time crafting. It keeps me busy with my hands, busy in my head. And you get to see something at the end. And this has been the really hardest part. What I usually like to do is I like to hang out with friends, kids. And in COVID times, like I'm everybody's favorite auntie. 
because I'm the one who gets to have fun. I don't have to do the rules. I don't have to do the responsibilities. I just play with the kids and let them go home once they're tired and cranky. <laughs> and so a lot of that is, and COVID has been really hard for that. And so finding new ways to handle the pressure in COVID times has been, I find gardening does a lot of the same things. Like I get to be out in the sun or else I get to be, we have a greenhouse. So in undercover, even if it's raining or windy, which it is here almost all the time. <laughs> and so finding ways to help things grow, to help things change and to learn something new because up until COVID, I really hadn't been gardening. So it's one of my new coping strategies besides all of my crafting because we do potlatch a fair amount. And so there's all of the crafting that needs to get done for that. But I'm, as someone had said earlier, I'm never sure whether to call that a hobby or if that's just another one of the things that I have to do every day. So yeah, that's me. Thank you, Jennifer. I was thinking about the question for Barb and, and uh, you know, I, and I, I remember asking my nanny this question and, and maybe I'll, if you can share a picture of my nanny before we go to, to Barb, um, Amber, this is my nanny. Her name was Lavina White and my nanny was a phenomenal woman. And she was the, I think the first and only woman president of the council of Haida nation. And whenever there is a dispute with our people anywhere in the province, my nanny would pack everything up, all her high heels, her really uh, beautiful clothes and head to wherever the, the fight was at that time to provide support. And uh, she also, you know, was way before her time and uh, also faced a lot of criticism and handled it with such grace. And I, I, aspire to be where my nanny was. And, um, you know, I, I really think about how, um, what she must have seen in her lifetime. And I guess this goes to the question that we, that we had for Barb. Um, and just sort of uh, getting a good understanding, Barb, of in your lifetime, uh, you must have uh, seen a lot of progress um, in their gender equity life in your lifetime. So I'm wondering if you can share with us sort of what you've observed and, and um, uh, uh, during your time and how is, it, how is it different now than it was before? I purposely avoided that question because I didn't <laughs> know if I could answer it, but I, um, as a residential school survivor, you know, that's one of the big things is, is um, not having to go to residential school anymore. At least my, my, great, my children, my great grandchildren, and now my great, great grandchildren won't have to go to residential school. So for me, that was a, a huge plus. Um, when I started out in life, as a young woman, um, I was relegated to, um, because of my, who I was born, First Nations woman. Um, when I went to the counselor to ask about going to university, she shook her head and said, oh no, you won't be going to university. You'll be a clerk. You'll be a store clerk or an office clerk. And that's all they saw for us, you know, was, was there was this, this glass or the cement ceiling that we were never going to get through. So seeing the changes in that aspect has been quite remarkable. I, um, I, I apprenticed at the National Film Board in Montreal, and I was the first woman that they had ever trained to be a cinematographer, and that was the first. You know, you look at today, um, things have changed considerably. You look at education and the fact that in 2015, the, the, the provincial government changed uh, the curriculum and said that they would include 
include um, information or teach traditional knowledge, which was a huge step. And now we don't lose our status, not that it's such a big deal, um, sorry. Um, we don't lose our status when we, when we marry or if we marry. Our kids carry our status. And working as I do with um, universities and in great um, integrating traditional knowledge um, is a huge step, you know, not just for women, but for all of us. And so that getting rid of, of hopefully the discrimination that's visited on women. When you think about murdered and missing women and girls, you know, you look at Terra Nullius, you look at Doctrine of Discovery, and you see where all that started from. The, the idea that we were no better than beasts um, and that they could take everything we own and kill us if they want and those sorts of things. There's been a bit of movement in that area. So, it, you know, I'm hopeful. I look at, at all your women, your young women that are doing amazing things. When I was a young girl, <laughs> that was never going to happen. But the perseverance and the education that you've got and the things that you step up and do, it's amazing, you know, it's amazing. And I, I'm so thrilled that, that you look at the Council of the Haida Nation. We have young women who have just graduated from university as member, elected members now. And I'm so thrilled, you know, it's, it's amazing to see the kinds of things. And you look at the different heads of our, gov our department, you look at all the places that women have stepped up, even though they have children at home, it's amazing, you know, I just, I feel like I say that word too much, but I, I'm just so taken by what everybody does, you know, and, and as a great grandmother, I, I want to jump up and down and say, yay, go for it, because that's the difference now, you know, our women, our women fill that space really well, because you think of the children, you think about the people behind us that need care and need to learn all these things. That's, that's how it's supposed to be. And it's wonderful. Yeah. How, Christine. How a Barb. That is amazing. And I agree. All of these women and all the women out there, we not only do our work, our job, then we go home and take care of our family. And then we take care of our community. And we do all of these things while juggling. I remember my son came to work with me one time. He just wanted to hang out with me all day. But I end up by two o'clock. He was like, I'm exhausted, mom. This is like, I'm going to go home because this is exhausting. And I think about all the women out there, um, all of you that do all of this extra hard work out there and then do these amazing leadership positions. I think Leslie had one more question for the panelists. Oh, go ahead, Barb. I, I just want to say one thing, Christy. Your, your nanny, when she ran and became the president of the Council of the Haida Nation, I was actually her vice president. Oh, her and I... Her and I ran together. We got elected in Masset. And it, it annoyed a few people. <laughs> that's all I'm going to say about it. Wow. Thank you for sharing that. Oh, that's emotional. That is amazing. And, and I think those are the stories we share with our next generation. Hawa. Yeah, Hawa. So I think... Um, I wanted to do one one round for all the panelists just to share one little like tidbit of advice, one quick sentence. Um, we have like like uh, Kiel Juice was saying, you know, there's a lot of younger women stepping into your shoes, and I feel like it was the few women. Um, are, are you able to share my picture, Amber? As a young woman, there's, there was very few women 
I felt like that had that space and um, and held that space for for people like me who wanted to go to education. There was a lot of men encouraging me, um, but there was very few women in those offices. And this is uh, my mentor for probably, um, I didn't actually start working with her until I was a rep for Council of the Haida Nation, but um, just witnessing her work, witnessing the space she kept, witnessing everything that she represented for our community. I didn't actually, probably didn't have, actually have a conversation with her until I was in my late thirties, but um, this is uh, the hereditary chief and also the, she was the executive director for the Council of the Haida Nation. We lost her a few years ago. It was um, very sudden, but her chief name is Tauga Hala Lega. And uh, she was the hereditary chief for Mam and Gitine here in Aukligae. So um, she progressed, I watched her progress through the years and, um, I think she held really good safe place for me to continue growing in my career and um, and just being able to have somebody like that to hold that space for me. I think all of you guys do that just by being you, right? Because that's what she did with me. Um, so if you guys have like any tidbit advice, a quick sentence, um, we're, we're getting really close on time. I really think uh, it's almost like a, a womanly thing to do to have a big, huge conversation in an hour and kick butt at it. So if you have any advice, we can start. I could see it goes Vanessa, Jennifer, Marilyn, Linda, and Keel Juice on my screen. So if we could go in that order and then uh, we'll do it do with Christine with the closing marks. So Vanessa. <laughs> Oh, well, Leslie, I thought it was going to be quite challenging to um, have a group of panelists be done in an hour. I thought we might need at least three, especially on International Women's Day. Right. So, <laughs> and I just want to say International Women's Day was very near and dear to my Aunt Merle's heart. I feel her, I feel her with us. She would have been the first one signed on and cheering for all of us and empowering all of us. So my advice is to believe in yourself and your strengths and hang around with like-minded people, make connections with individuals. Also don't be afraid to stand out and be different. You don't have to follow mainstream and do things because everyone else is doing it. I think it's just, um, for me, it's empowering our youth and, um, you know, they're coming back with their education and we need to make places for them in your in our organizations. And um, we have a new marine biologist in Haida Fisheries and it's like, I'm going to empower you. I'm going to stand with you. I like the breath of fresh air. She's putting in new projects and, um, you know, moving them into modern times for us projects that needed new life. And so I think that is one of the main things we need to do is to empower our youth. Um, so how everyone, it's been an out, it's been an honor. And I have to say that like, I don't think it was fair at the beginning because I was so emotional from watching the video that uh, I shouldn't say fair, but just it made me very emotional to watch the video myself and three of my four kids with me out at the beach doing just something that we do, like harvest off the land. And so I do feel very honored to be here. So big hello to all, to all of you. And I wish you all well. Hello, hello Vanessa. Uh, Jennifer? Um, I think my piece of advice is don't let anyone else tell you what you can do as either a First Nations person, as a woman, as someone who is involved in First Nations governance, because a lot of the time people are indoctrinated into one way of thinking or the other. If someone tells you that you can't do this because of these reasons, just look for the 
other options for how you can do it, because quite often the only reason people don't think they can do it is because everybody has told them that they can. And one of the things that working with Western science and traditional ecological knowledge is that is learning that when we're too ingrained in one way of thinking, we don't see where the overlaps are and then things fall between the cracks between those overlaps. That really anything is possible as long as you're able to work at it. And as long as it's something that you're passionate about. If you're not passionate about it, then you won't, you won't put in the same kind of effort that you would. So if you aren't passionate about what you're doing, find what you're passionate about doing and do it, do that. Because honestly, being happy at what you're doing makes it so much easier to get up out of bed every morning than trying to do something because it pays well or try to, trying to do something because so-and-so wanted you to do that. Just find what you're interested in and live that. Awesome. How are uh, Marilyn? You know, it's been a real honor to, to be with all of you here tonight on, on International Women's Day, you know, as coastal women, you know, women that are, you know, working hard to, you know, make a better life for our communities. Um, I think that uh, advice that I would have would be, you know, just know your, your, know your power, know your inner strength, you know, um, you know, stand, you know, strong for yourself, you know, be, love yourself, be kind to yourself. And, you know, when you feel like you need some support, um, you know, I've done this going into press conferences, you know, I'm, I'm not always, you know, I get these butterflies and I get these, you know, you know, because you can't control what people are going to ask you or what's going to happen, right? It's all, you know, a bit of a wild card. And, you know, I'll take that time, regardless of where I am, to, you know, just call on my grannies to be with me, you know, and give me that support and stand with me. You know, I need you. And, you know, I'll do that, you know, as we're walking into, you know, a press conference, um, you know, and, and I think that that's, you know, just, you know, the, the power that we have as women, you know, is deep within our hearts. So just draw on it because it's there. Thank you. Hello. Linda? Thank you all. Thank you for having me to this evening. Um, it's been very heartwarming uh, to hear the power within the group and um, in my work, um, some of the comments that I always say to our community, our hereditaries, is, together we are stronger. Together we are stronger. And I always, I, I plead with our people, please don't step on our women. Please don't step on our women. And women don't step on each other's. I, that's been my plea in the past three years that I've been the elected chief. Going forward, any advice that I would give to, to others is to persevere, never give up, ask for help. If one door doesn't open for you, find another door to knock on, but never give up and believe in yourself. So thank you for having me today. How are you just? How are First of all, I want to say hello to everybody um, for honoring or allowing me to be part of, of this tonight. I'm, I'm, I'm thrilled. I, the thing I would say to young people is live, live your words. My dad told me that if you live your words, you don't have to worry about making things right and you can, you can live comfortably. The, the other thing is, is for me is one of respect and setting boundaries and, and upholding those boundaries so that you're safe and, and you treat other people with respect and accept the responsibility that we have as members of the nations. You know, we have a responsibility to 
try and make things right because the world we live in is, is not a good one right now. You know, we have, we have this epidemic and then we also have the climate change and food security is very important. So I feel like, you know, we have all these balls that we're trying to keep up in the air and do things that are right. So how to everybody for everything that you've said. And I hope that we have the opportunity to pass this all on to our young people. So how very much. Thank you. Um, how about to everybody, everybody who has signed on tonight, who's um, shared tonight and um, also Coastal First Nations for hosting this evening. Um, I think it's a really good kickoff to series like this. And um, I feel like I learned so much. I feel a little bit more grounded actually than when we first started. And it's, I think it's just the energy that these women carry with them and just make you wanna like just relax and trust. And um, so I just wanna thank all of you guys for sharing your, your wisdom with us. Um, and uh, everybody, we hope to see you all again in the next webinar. Chris? Yeah, how about to everybody and, and uh, especially to Leslie, my co-host. I phoned her two days ago and said, Leslie, can you please help me? <laughs> so thank you for, for, for trusting the process. And Amber, if you can show your face on here too as well, and, and Bessie Brown for all the hard work you guys did as well, setting this up and, and getting everything organized. Uh, big how to, there you are, Amber, thank you. And Bassie uh, for thinking of this really wonderful opportunity for us to share. Thank you, Bessie. I do uh, really do want to thank everybody for coming in. We're hoping to have more series coming up. We're just going to be doing some planning around it. We want to call it Coastal Connections. We'll be bringing you renewable energy discussions, uh, climate change discussions. So we're, we're really hoping to expand this. We're glad that everybody got to enjoy tonight. And stay tuned for the next series and we'll make sure to have it. We'll be posting this online as well. We'll make sure to have uh, this posted uh, probably in the next couple of days and then you can share it. So how about for everybody, thank you for being with us tonight. Good night. <laughs>